Good morning and welcome. Thank you all very much for joining us this Friday morning. Uh, I'm Merit Jane Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs, and really I am very delighted uh, to welcome you and to introduce uh, His Excellency Thomas Henry Gilles, the President of the Republic of Estonia. Uh, I'd like to welcome the President not only to SIPA, but also to his alma mater, Columbia University, and uh, to this region where he was raised. Although born in Sweden, uh, the President grew up close by in New Jersey, just across the GW Bridge. And before he was elected President in 2006, he served in Washington, D.C. as the ambassador uh, of the Republic of Estonia to the United States and uh, to Canada. He was Minister of Foreign Affairs, a member of the Estonian Parliament, Vice President of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament. So as you can see, he's had an extraordinary career uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, really is playing a very significant role uh, in Europe. Uh, during his presidency, he has promoted a number of initiatives that have really generated tremendous interest and attention around Estonian innovation, around transatlantic relations, uh, around international trade issues, and cybersecurity. I think uh, most of us know uh, that some of the, the underlying features of Skype were invented in Estonia, and Estonia has introduced many innovations around uh, e-governance. Uh, this morning, I believe he will speak uh, to us about the important geopolitical uh, developments in Europe and the challenges uh, facing international peace and security. So please join me in welcoming the President of Estonia. Thank you so much. Well, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, forgot to mention, well, it's kind of mentioned, but uh, why I'm wearing this tie is because uh, I, I'm Columbia College 76, but it's not simply kind of a uh, raw, raw belief uh, or pleasure in my reminiscing about my times in Quach, uh, uh, but rather uh, that I think uh, the Columbia College education at the core is one of the most, uh, has been one of the most significant of my life, and as I've forgotten everything that I've learned when I was an undergraduate in the college, uh, in my major, uh, I go back to CC and hum uh, almost interchangeably with what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and I think that all the rest of the world's universities should adopt the same thing, <laughs> but unfortunately they don't. But that's why I always Sprung in my life is from. Um, well, that's why it's always a pleasure for me to speak at my alma mater. Uh, last year I spoke uh, over at Lowe on cybersecurity and uh, governance. Uh, we are a highly <coughs> digitized society and we do take our cyber threat seriously. But at that time, just a year ago, we had no idea how much the world would, around us would change within months. Um, in fact, I would, my argument will be that in the past seven months we have seen a complete, uh, uh, a complete sea change in the security environment of at least the transatlantic area for which we were not prepared. Um, there had been warning signs, uh, uh, for example, Russia's aggression against Georgia in 2008 was a wake-up call, but uh, everyone had news button, chose to ignore it, and uh, a month after Sarkozy had, uh, President Sarkozy had uh, announced his peace plan, um, uh, and the fact that there would be no further related, significant relation between the EU and Russia unless it was followed uh, under the French presidency of President Sarkozy, and they said, no, we're not going to do anything about it, even though the peace plan provisions of removal of Russian troops uh, so we knew beforehand that things were shifting, but we chose to not. Uh, we chose not to pay attention. 
But in November this year, we will celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Berlin Wall. 1989, for us indeed, was the Annus Mirabilis. The Cold War ended, the Iron Curtain crumbled, and we had a continent-wide euphoria. And Estonia, too, along with our two Baltic neighbors of Latvia and Lithuania, were soon to be liberated from the Soviet occupation that had lasted in our country for half a century. Um, looking back, we realized that a whole era ended that time. About a, a half a century in the status quo, we had become used to it, at least those of us my age and Jenny Grayman's age. We, we grew up in the Cold War. Um, and at least our part of the world changed radically and permanently, we thought, for the better. 20 years ago, on August, and proceeding from those <coughs> events in our country, for example, 20 years ago this August, uh, the last Soviet occupation or Russian occupation troops left. That was the final, final sort of sign that we, uh, that the Cold War, at least in our country, So it could all be a reason to celebrate a Fukuyama triumph of liberal democracy. But instead, we are now watching a new wave of authoritarianism rising throughout Europe, and tensions growing also in, in Europe and other areas. We also see a renewed battle of ideas where liberal democracy is no longer the obvious winner. We see a return of cynical geopolitics, of lies and propaganda at an altogether new level. And raw force has returned as a foreign policy tool in an area that we that had not seen that actually in uh, 75 years. And you tell them before, the 50 years before 1989, the world had been bipolar, consisting of liberal democracy with market economies found mainly in the West versus illiberal autocracy combined with collective ownership, also known as communism, mainly in the East. And then there was the so-called third world that was too poor to be considered part of either camp and thus wasn't. So we actually, I mean, I just say this now, that the division of the world into East and West uh, that we lived through throughout all those years actually didn't take into account much of the world altogether different, uh, different uh, conditions, but we do look at, we do look at the, at the, the uh, Cold War as an east-west thing, which it was, but uh, just as a little proviso here, footnote, let's not, let's not think the entire thing was like that. But this neat simplistic order was beginning to crumble and would soon collapse. The first semi-democratic election in the communist world was held in Poland uh, in the summer of 89, and the non-communists won those elections despite the fact that they were slant, slanted in a way to keep them from winning. Uh, that too was a, a, a milestone in an irreversible march toward liberty, one of many. And we had the Velvet Revolution, we had the Baltic Way of chain of a million people countries holding hands to demonstrate their quest for liberty. <coughs> it was also in 1989 that Francis Fukuyama published The End of History, one of the seminal essays of the late 20th century, later expanded into a book of the same name. Uh, and he argued, I have read it, that the ideological debate between liberal democracy and authoritarian communism was over and that liberal democracy had won. Fukuyama, of course, received a lot of criticism for his optimism, but much of the criticism actually hit at a straw man or a piñata, uh, because he never claimed that liberal democracy had won in the real world, or that all countries in the world had embraced or would embrace democracy. Rather, he said that the contest of ideas that no one could any longer make claims for the superiority of an authoritarian regime. Back in 1989, we took all those events that I mentioned, the various revolutions, as proof of Fukuyama's Hegelian view of history 
and the ineluctable victory of liberal democracy. For a while, it seemed that was the direction toward which we were moving. We in Estonia knew what we wanted. We wanted to be part of the West. We quickly did the reforms that we needed to do and became members of NATO, the EU, and various, all the other Western and international organizations. When I say quickly now, that's a retrospect, actually. It was a long, hard slog, and I probably aged 15 years doing both the EU negotiations and the NATO side of things, but now it all seems quickly. Many of the other countries in our region did the same, and we expected in a Fukuyama spirit that all of the post-communist world would follow. But not nearly, not nearly all of the post-communist countries did the reforms we did. In fact, looking back on who reformed and who did not, actually it's a rather low number. Um, uh, just a while back, I looked at the um, Freedom House, uh, Freedom House uh, ratings of democracies, and and then I compared them to the countries that were uh, broadcast to by Radio Free Europe in the, uh, before the revolutions. And actually we see that 80% uh, of the population of the, of the countries that Radio Free, broad, Free Europe and Radio Liberty broadcast to today are either only partially or unfree. In fact, or the other way around, actually a fairly small number of countries that were broadcast to that were considered part of the authoritarian world today can be considered liberal democracies. <coughs> they also all, almost all of them, belong to the European Union uh, and or to NATO. <coughs> what happened was that countries didn't do reforms, corruption and authority, uh, corruption flourished, authoritarianism uh, uh, came back or never left, and more broadly today, we see the ghosts of the 20th century that we thought we'd never see again returning to our midst. The annexation of territory, violation of borders, aggression, an anti-liberal ideology combining religious conservatism with political authoritarianism and imperialist bravado promoted in opposition to our liberal democratic ideals. It's all back. So Fukuyama's optimism, even about the end of the battle of ideas, no longer seems so justified. The battle of ideas is back, and as much as cynical geopolitics. In a way, we are in a harder place now in this battle than we were during the last decade of the Cold War, the 1980s. Back then, it had all become kind of a joke. The alternative to liberal democracy was not credible not credible to the populations of the countries that were living under authoritarianism or communism. <coughs> no one on either side of the Iron Curtain took communist propaganda seriously because it was simply so ridiculous. The ideas we're fighting now are more dangerous. They have far greater appeal than autocratic communism has. <coughs> now Russia has the world's largest and best PR firms doing their work for them. During the last half year, we have seen claims made not only by obvious uh, autocrats, but even by a prime minister of a European Union member state that the time for liberal democracy is over. Today, more than 80% of Russians support annexation through military aggression in Crimea, where the Anschluss of territory was justified by the presence of co-ethnics just as it was back in 1938 when Adolf Hitler annexed the Sudetenland. There is precisely the same argument. Um, actually, the argument is far older. It's uh, Ubi Romani, Ibi Roma, uh, which goes back to the Roman Empire. Where there is a Roman, there there is Rome. But uh, Adolf Hitler brought it back into, uh, well, actually, to be precise, actually, it's also known as irredentism from, from Irredenta part of Italy that there was made an appeal to the Italians living across the border. Uh, but Adolf Hitler is best known for this argument in uh, with the annexation of Sudetenland, but later the dismemberment of uh, Sudetenland, Slovakia as 
well as the Anschluss of Austria. We see in addition to that argument, we see widespread support for an anti-liberal attack against Western decadent permissiveness, be it in freedom of speech, free choice of one's life partners, or the empowerment of women. I could go on and on, but basically we do see a, we do see a very revanchist, anti-liberal, dem democratic view in a number of countries. So liberal democracy is not one the battle of ideas against authoritarianism, because actually a lot of people like these things we consider anti-liberal democratic. And it has even failed to prevent the resurrection of that once vanquished demon fascism. As a horrifying recent example, you can look at the, uh, the video uh, on the YouTube of the so-called Biker Show, which was held in Sevastopol uh, on August 8th, uh, which is a genuine Wagnerian Gesamtkunstwerk that makes Lenny Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will look mild and meek, uh, where there is rock and roll, hundreds of bikers, ballet dancers, light shows, hip-hop bands, um, plus tanks, and calls to kill Ukrainians. Um, as an aside, I, was, I don't know how, how much he's read here today, but uh, I think uh, the, uh, if any of you know the name Carl Schmidt, um, that's Carl with a C, and Schmidt, C-H-M-I-T-T, smartest philosopher in Nazi Germany, who basically is considered to have made the uh, intellectually most coherent attack on liberal democracy in a book called uh, The Idea of the Political, or The Concept of the Political, uh, the Begriff des Politisches, uh, in which he basically says politics is not about liberal democracy, politics is about us versus them. And I see this being, uh, I see this repeatedly right now in the kind of the ideological debate on the authoritarian side. Um, and it's interesting that Alexander Dugin, one of the sort of primary uh, intellectual figures uh, in Russia today arguing against democracy and for fascism, uh, has been uh, was a member of a fascist party, uh, is also the uh, pr primary promoter of uh, Karl Schmitt today and actually produced a Russian translation of Carl Schmitt's works. So looking at a wider picture, I think we are dealing now with an ideolo ideological mix that I already sort of feared in 1994, uh, hoping it would never expand to any place, but I would I could call it the Milosevization of Russia. Slobodan Milosevic uh, was, a, there were these horrible scenes back 20 years ago where you know, Orthodox priests were blessing tanks and Kalashnikovs with holy water, sending them off to kill Bosnians. Uh, when I saw the Crimea takeover, I saw videos of Orthodox priests blessing Russian tanks. Um, I mean, again, it's this kind of odd mix that I think hailed back to uh, Nicholas I in Russia where he had a sort of a three-part view of what Russia should be, the, the sort of the basis of the future Russia and uh, Nicholas I in the 1830s was autocracy, orthodoxy, and derjava, which would mean kind of like great statehood. Um, we, we see that um, just most recently, the patriarch of the Orthodox Church was given um, a private jet fighter, the most modern and very, very fast fighter in Russia, the SU. 35. I mean, so we're, we're getting a little, I mean, things, are, the categories are getting a little mixed here, at least from a, from a liberal democratic point of view, uh, in terms of separation of church and state and the military. This, this combination of authoritarianism, orthodoxy, illiberalism, nationalism, and ethnic hatred was bad enough in Serbia with a population of 7 million. But now we see it on the rise in Russia a country of 140 million in nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, versions of this sinister ideological mix have more appeal not only in Russia, but also in what we thought of as the bastion of liberal democracy in Western Europe. 
which should remember all too well the demons of the ideologies of hatred. Last spring, Europe voted in the European parliamentary elections, and a number of neo-fascist nationalist parties not only overcame the threshold for getting into the European Parliament, where they now are, but in some countries they were among the most popular parties. The Front National in France, if there, which is a party like this, are very supportive, sort of in some sense, idealizes, idealizes uh, Vladimir Putin. I just read uh, oh, a couple of weeks ago that were the French elections to be held today, then Marie Le Pen of the Front National would win the elections, even after the runoffs. Uh, we see similar parties in, uh, uh, in, a, number of other, in a, num a number of other countries who did very well. I just mentioned it because in contrast to all the propaganda about the Ukrainians being fascist, there were two fascist, fascist or sort of neo-fascist candidates in the region. Uh, in the Ukrainian presidential elections, which took place on the same day where the Front National in Europe won. Uh, and there, uh, the, the two of them, neither of the two candidates could even muster 1% in the Ukrainian elections. So that, so when you hear of this, I mean, this bombardment, this propaganda about Ukrainians being fascist, the people who were fascist, the little nutcases, they did not, I mean, they didn't even get 1%, whereas in Europe, you see, among the most popular parties in the parliament from some countries are already strictly neo-fascist. And we see, we see the same phenomenon, unfortunately, in parts of Europe that were like us in Estonia, liberated from communism in 1989, and should know the values of freedom and democracy, which is the path they once chose. We see it even in the, most, the, the mostly very liberal and tolerant uh, north of Sweden's national elections less than two weeks ago, the far right and racist Sweden Democrats more than doubled its share of votes from 5.7 to 13%, which is in parliamentary democracies where you have a number of parties, not just two. That's a big number. That's a, that's a, that's a party that can, in fact, uh, make or break a government. And it is the far right parties of Europe, the likes of the, uh, the I mentioned the French Front National, the British National Party, the Golden Dawn in Greece, and Jobbik in Hungary, who support the actions of the Kremlin. They went to observe the illegal so called referendum in the, in, in the next Crimea. They arranged international conferences with Kremlin ultra nationalist leaders like. Alexander Dugin, who I just mentioned before, to share imperialist and racist geopolitical fantasies. According to, and here in the United States, according to BuzzFeed, Richard Spencer, the president of the U.S. white nationalist think tank, so think tank in quotes, uh, the National Policy Institute, or NPI, is just about to publish a book on the, ph uh, the philosophy of Dugin and Heidegger so that it is building up its intellectual source as well. So why is it that the ideals of liberal democracy have fallen into disrepute in the heart of Europe and aggressive, fiercely anti-liberal doctrines of massive support in Russia and increasingly also in the West? Why is it that from our perspective today, everything seems more insecure than even in the Cold War, when at least some rules of international behavior were followed and we had some sense of moral clarity. <clears throat> well, I've argued that we can find part of the answer in another essay that also became a best-selling book, Samuel Huntington's The Clash of Civilizations, which was published four years after Fukuyama's essay, where Huntington saw future conflicts in the post-ideological age to be conflicts between cultures and civilizations, which all seem to be unfortunately verified by the attacks of 9-11. But Huntington's ideas were also heavily criticized. Soon enough, however, we were challenged on our own ground in, in New York, Madrid, London, Washington, Bombay. All of these attacks uh, 
challenge the liberal order, attacking democratic elections, the equality of men and women, the separation of church and state, and the rule of law, not men or God. Those attackers were the greatest of Huntingtonians. They were the ones who claimed that some cultures are simply not compatible with democracy, like the people attempting to create a theocracy in the Middle East today, and like the authoritarians who more and more boldly define themselves in opposition to our, quote, decadent democratic values. They seem to use Huntington as a, uh, Huntington as a pre prescriptive f source rather than as a descriptive model, which was after all what Huntington was trying to do. It was, but they seem to be reading the book as a manual, trying to create a world which their societies reject democracy, appealing instead to their culture or their civilization. For a while, this looked like a revolt, at least to me, as a revolt against modernity from the outside, and in the Middle East, one could still claim that. But until recently, we had thought that our, on our own continent, the uh, defeat of Nazism and the collapse of communism had settled once and for all the Hegelian intellectuality of the triumph of liberal democracy, just as what we had predicted, and hoped that, and I hope that democracy, that democracy in Russia would also reign supreme, uh, as some politicians in Europe still seem to do. We'd also come to believe that certain tenets of international law uh, were so self-evident that they would never be broken. We believe that territorial annexation based on co-ethnics abroad, which as I mentioned we saw in 1938, uh, were settled for good on May 8, 1945, which was the day that finally Nazi, the Nazis were defeated. Uh, instead, it's resurrected. Um, we, thought, uh, we thought that um, after the 2008 aggression in Georgia that uh, people would wake up and notice that things had changed. But what, what you've seen in the past seven months is that all of the rules and agreements of any importance that define the world after the Cold War, in fact, I would argue even after World War II, have been declared in practice null and void. Um, we, see, we see that uh, the basic tenets uh, that we have all trusted, and that not just, not just in the past 20 years, but really going back to 1945, uh, in practice uh, have been thrown out the window. First, there was the prohibition of aggression that came into effect with the UN Charter from 1945, stating that members shall refrain in their, I'm quoting now, the members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or the use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. I mean, this was 1945, and this was one of the uh, key ideas that people came up with because they didn't want to see a repeat of World War II. Later, during the Cold War, there's the Helsinki Final Act of 1975, in which all transatlantic countries agreed not to use force to change borders or challenge the political independence of any state. Um, I mean, this was not the entire world like the UN, but this is basically from Vancouver to Vladivostok, to quote Bill Clinton. I mean, it was all of the transatlantic, not only transatlantic community, but basically the Northern Hemisphere agreed on this. We agreed to agree, we agreed to regard one another's frontiers inviolable, to refrain from making each other's territory the object of military occupation, and we explicitly had in that charter statement that no occupation or acquisition of this type would be considered legal or recognized as legal. And we went on in the sort of euphoria at the end of the Cold War in 1990 with the CSC Paris Charter for New Europe, which again, although they opened to current the OSCE, then CSC countries signed, uh, including the newly free Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary, as well as the Russia's legal predecessor, the USSR, they agreed to, quote, to fully, the, fully recognize the freedom of states to choose their own security arrangements. Already in 2008, 
It was uh, when, uh, after the war uh, in Georgia, both President, then President Medvedev and then Prime Minister Putin, I said, actually, the reason we invaded Georgia was to prevent Georgia from joining NATO. So that already then, we see the Paris the Charter lost its, uh, its meaning. All these agreements, to bring it now into a larger perspective, all these agreements that we built up during the Cold War and after the Cold War, were all concluded in the very liberal spirit of Immanuel Kant's essay, Perpetual Peace, which appeared in 19, 1795. The intellectual foundations of the European Union, as well as of NATO, ultimately rest on that essay, in which he argued two centuries ago, um, precisely what would become our dominant foreign policy mantra, which is that republics, which is what the term he used, but what he meant would, today would mean a democratic state based on rule of law, that form a federation do not wage war on each other. So basically, if you have democratic countries in an organization, treaty bound, they will not fight one another. That is NATO, that is the EU today. The current, I mean, if I would say the European Union and NATO, in fact, have proved Kant's theoretical conception to be right. But we were wrong in believing that this extended to those countries outside the Federation of Liberal Democracies, whatever that might be, um, that it also might work with those that are not in the Federation and are not republics or liberal democratic rule-based societies. And that is what I think one of the fundamental problems we have to face is how do, how do you keep peace in a world with those countries that are outside the Federation of Democracies? Today, I would say that we find ourselves in a completely new and unforeseen security environment. I wouldn't call it a new Cold War, because even during the Cold War, basic agreements were followed. The Cold War, yes, was terrible, but at least the agreements signed with the Soviet Union were adhered to. Um, after the Helsinki Final Act was signed in 1975, they did not violate territories, at least not, of the, not those of CSC member states, as we do recall they invaded Afghanistan, but, but Afghanistan is not part of the space. Now we're back, I would argue, in an age better described by Thomas Hobbes, one of my favorites from CC here, by the way. Because we are living now in 2014 in a Hobbesian state of nature where one cannot count on agreements and life is a war of all against all. One of the triumphs of after the Bosnian War was that the countries that were at war have signed the CSE Paris Charter. But what, what do we do when various countries decide that the CSE or OSC Accord do not mean anything anymore and that they can be violated? If one can get away with it, and there will be others who will also want to get away with it, and I'm not even talking about countries outside the OSC, if they see the success of the policies that we have seen pursued in the last seven months, it, it, it will all add to the instability of the world. So I would argue that the situation is far more serious than, um, than uh, we realize. We only talk about Ukraine. We talk about you know, MH17. But the point is that agreements that ke have kept the world more or less safe are a bit abandoned, and I think we have a much larger problem because it's not just a matter of our own neighborhood. What is happening in Ukraine is not an East European issue, just as totalitarianism was not just an East European issue 75 years ago when Stalin and Hitler divided part of Europe among themselves or between them. And we have to realize in this highly globalized world that we live in that there is no, quote, far away country no one knows about, to quote Neville Chamberlain before the Munich, Munich uh, uh, agreement to dismember Czechoslovakia. Uh, we cannot anymore afford to, and we will not accept, I hope, dividing free countries into spheres of influence. Uh, we in Estonia are very glad we're getting support from our NATO allies. We're glad President 
grateful to President Obama who visited Tunney three weeks ago for the NATO Wales summit, uh, confirming that spheres of influence don't really exist for the NATO side. They don't, do not exist, and we're not going to be seeing uh, a, a weakening of support for NATO members based on where they're from. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're confused today on where things are going because the liberal de democratic order is being challenged in ways we did not foresee when the Berlin Wall was torn down. Instead of a new Cold War, which people bandy about, this confusion to me looks more like before the old Cold War. Uh, the years right after World War II when we didn't know what to do. I guess everyone here was born after World War II, but anyway. I assume people didn't know what they do from reading the history books. Did, you know, 1945, 1946, erstwhile allies again in the fight against Nazi, Nazism, the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, the U.S. found that, in fact, their erstwhile ally was no longer acting like an ally. Uh, they didn't know what to do when they saw one by one governments in Czechoslovakia, Poland, Romania, Hungary being toppled, the Civil War, and Greece. I mean, this was, this was supposed to be our guy over there, you know, Joe, who helped us fight the Nazis, and instead we're seeing these governments falling. Um, and so I think well, that's where we are today. We're looking at things happening, trying to scratch our heads. Different people have different conceptions. I'm promoting one, someone else will tomorrow will see it a little differently, but the idea is we can't really fathom what's going on in, in the world, why it is that things are going this way and why the old agreements no longer work. We still want the, the grand old coalitions we had, um, but they, we don't have them anymore. Uh, just as in 1940, uh, 42 to 46, we had our grand coalition with, uh, with the Soviets. Uh, we want to ha find out some way of, we want to find, we want to figure out what's going on, how to proceed. Um, we want everyone to sort of, everyone's dreams to come true and we and go back to the status quo ante, that Crimea will be restored to the Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine will calm down, that we don't have to go into sanctions, that we don't have to raise defense expenditures, that we can go on making money with our deals in Russia and our, with our financial institutions and our lucrative trade. Here I can't resist another favorite of mine from C.C. Lenin, who importantly said the capitalists will sell us the rope with which we will hang them. Uh, we know that things may be going awry, but maybe we can still make one more deal, build one more Maybe we can sell a little bit more military hardware before we have to stop. Which, and uh, what we see now is this thinking of, let's sell just one more military ship, and after that, we won't sell them anymore. Mm -hmm. And maybe within Europe, the right-wing populists, the Jobbiks, the National Fronts, and others will come around to their senses and realize, my God, democracy is a good thing. And maybe we can convince the Russians that homophobia, censorship, repressions at home, and little green men, and lies and propaganda, the disdainful mocking of prisoners of war, sending uninvited humanitarian convoys and Russian troops to vacation in, in Ukraine, which was all a big mistake. And that we'll wake up from a bad dream and restore the status quo ante at the end of history. But I don't think we can go on just hoping that the bad dream will go away. Uh, we have to make it up. We have to wake up and make it go away. We have to get and find a way out of this new situation and we need to do it together. Um, and things are changing. Um, NATO is very, if you recall, 20 years ago, Richard Lugar wrote an article, NATO out of area or out of business in the spirit of the Cold War saying, now we don't have to do anything. And, I mean, NATO lost its purpose, but we have to set NATO elsewhere, now basically it's back in area and back in business. Um, the European Union and the United States have introduced sanctions to stop Russia, the NATO presence in, uh, among Eastern European allies uh, is, has significantly increased, but we don't know whether that's enough for increased security in our region. 
Every conflict has implications that reach wider in, than the geographical region fought over. Each aggression is about scare tactics. Russian aggression in Ukraine has been followed by attempts at intimidation and destabilization elsewhere. Uh, also in the Baltic states in Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine, uh, uh, countries have been punished for their turn toward Europe. We returned, we returned to Europe, at least we three, the Esto Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, returned to, uh, to Europe as soon as the collapse made it possible and worked very hard on it. So it's a lot harder to punish us because we're in again, but those other countries that have been slower basically face an uphill battle with serious attempts to destabilize their country. And on top of that, there's information war going on and all kinds of weapons are being used. There is this uh, concept of the Ruski Mir, the Russian world, which basically says that Russia is, is not about territory, it's about the Russian world. So anywhere there is, where there is a Russian, there is Russia, which probably makes life not only worrisome for countries like mine, but if they follow that idea, but uh, also at Brighton Beach. Um, <laughs> we see airspace constantly being violated in, uh, in our region, not just our countries, but also neutral Sweden. Finland, where we see exercises planning uh, massive attacks on their countries. So we are, we're in a mess. I'm not going to offer any answers here. So. Mm. <laughs> but we are in a mess. Uh, Milan Kundera wrote in 1984 that in 1956, Europe was fought for in Budapest, not in London. Now, this new Europe's meaning, future identity, is being fought for in Ukraine. All of, all of Eastern Europe that, is, that wants to live in liberal democracy is being threatened. And I think it is up to us to do something about it. Now we're on the, the I guess, the right side of, the, of this divide that is being created against our will, but at least we're liberal democracies and want to defend those things. But we have to understand that in places like Ukraine today, um, we see the rise of, the, or we see rising uh, a distinct sort of pseudo-philosophical approach to geopolitics that could be very threatening to all of us in the future. And with that wonderful appealing note, I'll close and answer your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me ask the first question and then uh, invite uh, questions from our audience to come up to the mic, if you would. Um, thank you for that remarkable set of remarks. When President Obama was in Tallinn earlier this month, as you alluded to, uh, he said, and I quote, in case all haven't read it, the defense of Tallinn and Riga and Vilnius is just as important as the defense of Berlin, Paris, and London. And I think this was one of the strongest statements by an American president uh, about its commitments to NATO defense uh, uh, and your region. Uh, and yet, I think this is not offering you much peace of mind. And I wonder, uh, 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 what you think the impact of this kind of statement is uh, on Russia, uh, uh, and what other steps you think are necessary uh, to put some parameters to what happens henceforth? Well, who knows whether it's, <laughs> whether it's being taken seriously in NATO, but it's nice to repeat those statements. Uh, because after, actually, uh, I mean, that's what Article 5 says. It's the three musketeer clause, all for one and one for all, and if you get attacked, uh, then NATO will, will come to your assistance. Um, and that's something which probably people who don't like NATO would like to test and probe to see whether it really holds. Uh, so far, it's held rather well, um, but of course, 
you know, basing, I mean, sort of, what do you have, uh, what a, kind of a silly argument. Oh, there are Russians living in your country, you're next. I mean, this is kind of a whole series of Narva's next, all these kind of sort of articles, um, because they say, okay, well, that was the argument made in Crimea, now it's going to be the argument, that's, that same is going to hold for, for Estonia, Latvia, and any number of other countries. Um, we don't think so for very obvious reasons, uh, because, all, because they're such different countries. Uh, economically, politically, socially, in terms of where we are. But that argument is being made. Um, we'll see. We're, uh, I mean, one thing that, is, uh, that came out of the NATO summit, of course, is that, um, that, uh, the, that NATO will increase uh, quite a bit, its presence in, uh, in Estonia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, which are the countries that have been most concerned about these developments. They are also all the, are the countries that, that directly neighbor Russia, uh, whereas no one else has, um, no one else has a um, direct border. And well, no Norway, to be precise, isn't one more NATO country that does it, but it's it's too cold up there. Yeah, it's very cold. Yeah. There's some questions from our audience. Yes, uh, standing up, you can come up and please a uh, brief question, sir. So, because we have a lot of. Here's a live on the Malam of the Herman Institute, a Ukrainian American from Donetsk, from the eastern part of Ukraine. I just came from there, and there's a cur currently an understanding in Ukraine that. Putin has already achieved his goals, and uh, what we can, ex we can expect from now on is a rollback of the sanctions regime, that he has, in, in effect, created this frozen conflict in eastern Ukraine, similar to what he did with the two republics in Georgia, uh, that from now on, what, you know, uh, there will be a chipping away at the sanctions. Would you think the sanctions have been effective? Do you think the sanctions should be continued, uh, and that they have a potential to bring about a change in Putin's behavior? If not, what do you think should be done in the month? Uh, ahead. Thank you. Uh, well, that's a short question with a short answer. Uh, they may, I mean, I, I'm not convinced that anyone has, uh, has achieved what they wanted in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, I think the situation is quite fluid. Uh, we saw actually when the Ukrainian forces began to win that that was actually when the troops were brought in. Uh, I mean, from r regular army forces from uh, Russia that were there supposedly on vacation. So um, it can change either way. Uh, sanctions as opposed to uh, other, math I mean, sanctions I'm not sure always are the, uh, the best way to deal with, uh, with aggre ongoing aggression. Sanctions take a while to take hold. Um, in fact, well, maybe not until next year or the year after that that, uh, that uh, someone says enough, these sanctions really are beginning to hurt our economy, but, but right now the effects, I mean, they may be uncomfortable for some, but more of the effects actually come from Putin's own sanctions imposed on importing Western foodstuff, which means that poorer quality but more expensive Russian goods are, <coughs> are what people have to buy. Uh, so I, I think we need more than that, or we need different kind of sanctions. Certainly, I would, uh, I mean, personally, what I would like to see, A, is uh, defensive lethal aid for Ukraine, and so you can, sh you know, sort of, they have very modern, I guess, T-90 tanks now uh, from Russia that uh, really are armed, armored in a way that uh, classical anti-tank weapons don't pierce. So, I mean, that kind, that's not offensive weaponry, but that's defensive. Uh, I would like to see a much stronger, uh, much stronger, uh, or application of anti-money laundering uh, laws, much more forcefully, better enforced on uh, the financial s centers in Europe, uh, because I mean, it's it, 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 there's a strong cost to actually taking in a lot of laundered money, uh, and that that's money that belongs to I mean that has been stolen from people, but is in the hands of the, of the people supporting Putin. And then perhaps moving beyond that, maybe instead of sanctioning individuals who are guilty or we think are sort of behind certain policies, you might want to extend, if this is legally possible, to their wives and mistresses and children. 
I mean, you can see major Russian figures who've, whose children have graduated my alma mater. Uh, and I find that hard to believe when their father is basically uh, denigrating Western ideas of liberal democracy while his daughter is taking CC. Other questions, I think. Yes, please. Jenna Graydon from SEPA. Uh, taking your sanctions in a different way, and it's a little bit provocative. One of the Achilles heels of the Ukraine has been the fact that it's been pretty much one of the most corrupt regimes since its independence. So in order to stabilize Ukraine and to bring it within the Western fold, don't we need to also have hard love vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine to follow the money? And can we work with people who have, let us say, not had the most uh, cleanest background as far as their own background? So can we work with regimes that effectively are the same as maybe on the other side of the border? Um. <laughs> um, I was just there a week ago in Kiev, um, and I actually said, okay, Ukraine is in a war, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to expect a country to do major reforms amidst, amidst the major conflict. Nonetheless, I mean, it is a serious problem. My country is um, in the top half of goodness in the European Union and overall uh, ranks uh, is in position 29 of the Transparency uh, Perceptions Index. Uh, all, and this is the best of any post-communist country by far. Uh, Russia is 128, so they're 100 behind us um, on that. But, but the sad part is that Ukraine is 144 and it's in there with Nigeria and the Central African Republic. That is bad. And I don't know what, what they can do. I mean, it has to be, you need to have the political will to do that. And when you have political parties that are owned by oligarchs, that becomes very difficult. Um, uh, re corruption reduction is one of the uh, most difficult tasks that any regime has to, uh, has to face, and I mean, in my country, I think one of the major reasons why we did it and why Ukraine can't do it is that is the form of privatization that we we followed is, it would, did not allow for the creation of oligarchs, whereas those who did large enterprise privatization using the voucher method have all have oligarchs who then control political parties. So I don't have an answer. I mean, I think. Um, it's going to be tough. And in fact, um, well, the United States has a lot of experience dealing with corrupt regimes. <laughs> I mean, but you probably can, you know what to do better uh, than we do. Uh, we just sort of worked hard at getting rid of it. It's a tough one, but I'll say with, unless they significantly reduce the, the corruption in Ukraine, this revolution will fail as well. Um, and then I'm not sure they're going to, there's going to be much of a, uh, I'm speaking now, this is not government policy, it's just my personal gut feeling is that after the failure of what of 91, the failure of the Orange Revolution in 2004, if 2014 fails, then there, uh, Europe will be, fa will be experiencing such Ukraine fatigue that uh, there won't be a fourth time, or as Bill Clinton said, three strikes and you're out. Um, so it really, people, sh uh, the first step I would say is, you know, understand that if you continue and if, or if you don't succeed in, re in re significantly reducing the corruption, uh, that uh, the West will turn away. May I collect one or two more sure. questions for you, May I, Professor Desai? And uh, let us collect a couple questions because we're already at the end a lot of, of people time. line up there, and then uh, we can take them. Yeah. Oh, now you're going to get a long line. <laughs> well, uh -huh. take, we'll take four, and then... <laughs> okay, good. Um, I'm no supporter of Vladimir Putin, far from it. Uh, but his popularity rating among Russians is close to 
especially after the seizure of Crimea. Um, don't you think that um, even without that, I mean, uh, Crimea, the vast majority of Russians outside of the small minority of urban, educated, young hotheads prefer a strong leader and an authoritarian order giving him a strong legitimacy. Well, I'm not sure it gives you a strong legitimacy if it's based on, uh, on a, in a media situation in which there is virtually no oppositional media. I mean, there is Dodge, which is a, a very small TV station. Yes. Uh, there is uh, Novaya Gazeta, uh, which is a very, uh, very low circulation newspaper. And all the other oppositional uh, outlets have been shut down. Just yesterday I read that that now Vedomosti and uh, the Mo and Moscow News, which are both, I'm mean, sure, foreign owned, uh, or have more than 30 percent foreign ownership, which were kind of liberal, more liberal voices. I mean, Moscow News is not in Russian, but it is from Russia. Vedomosti is on business, but you know the liberal tendencies of the business community came out there, and they did expose all kinds of corruption. Since they're owned by a Finnish company, Sonoma, uh, they, they fear they will be shut down because they're partially for, foreign owned. Um, so the media environment in Russia is not one where you get any kind of alternative view. Uh, the media view of Russia is the kind of, I mean, is even far more biased than what you see on RT. Now, so I would, in, our, in answer to your question, I don't think that gives you legitimacy if you live in a, in a information, I mean, in, a, in, a, in an information world that is monopolized by the government. But throughout their history, Russians had a strong uh, authoritarian leaders, right? So. Well, and look where they'd ended up each time. Perhaps we should collect a few questions and, and let uh, the president respond. Given the uh, reserves of the tar sands in Estonia, what are the um, opportunities for developing the alternative energy sector? And also, what are the biggest challenges and opportunities for growing the Estonian economy? Thank you. We'll collect a few questions. Hi, my name is Don, SIPA student, studying energy. Kind of a follow-up question. What is Estonia doing to uh, diversify from Russian sources of uh, natural gas and oil. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, hi, my name is Mix. I'm from uh, Latvia, and my question is regarding the uh, Baltic U Unity. So, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated uh, the Baltic Unity Day. However, uh, more and more, it seems like Baltic Unity becomes a problem. This is regarding Rail Baltic, uh, the the problems of establishing the liquefied uh, gas terminals, and so on. Uh, you yourself have hinted that uh, Estonia is not really a Baltic state, but is more of a Scandinavian state. Uh, so what do you think uh, could be done at this point to improve Baltic unity, specifically in the case with Ukraine? And how do you think uh, leaders in uh, other Baltic states could uh, work better? Thank you. My name is Jonathan, a former SIPA student. Do you believe that the Baltic states face a real or imminent threat of invasion by Russia in the same form that we've seen in eastern Ukraine? Okay. Well, on energy, energy diversification, I think we're sort of way up there in terms of meeting all the various goals um, that we need to. So I guess, what are we, 20% is renewable already now that we're supposed to meet that by 2020 in the European Union. Um, so wind biofuels. Uh, there's one big misconception, I don't know which person asked on the energy, the other person, but uh, basically uh, we have very low dependence on Russian gas. Our, the dependence we have on gas, which is about 10% of our energy mix, is 100% from Russia, but it is 10% of our energy mix. We have, I mean, our major source of energy is uh, oil shale uh, and so we are actually in a fairly good position uh, and conversion in the case, uh, in were, the, were these, um, were there to be a block, a blockade of energy as we have seen in the past that have, and, and has led us to deal with the issue of 
alternative sources of energy, uh, we're actually not, we won't be touched much. Um, you asked about economy, someone asked about the uh, opportunity. Well, I mean, what our economy is moving more and more, to, uh, the, the whole area I did not talk about today, but I mean, as the country that invaded Skype, I mean, we have just, our, the, our economy is becoming more and more digitized and is uh, both as a major, um, major place for startups as well as all kinds of services in, uh, in, in the IT sector, that is where the biggest opportunities are, both by us and as elsewhere. Baltic Unity, uh, I mean, I would say the Baltic states have, are more, have more in common and done more together than any other grouping in Euro the European Union. I mean, far, 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 far more than the Benelux countries. Um, in terms of defense, economic, transport, all those forms of, uh, of uh, cooperation. And the problems that we have negotiating on deals that involve three countries are far, are minor compared to the analogous issues faced, say, between any three other countries. You know, Finland, Sweden, and Norway negotiating something that, w you know, of the kind that we are negotiating now. I mean, they're much, much tougher. And when I said that Estonia, I said Estonia is culturally more Scandinavian, or rather Nordic, which has nothing to do with political ties. It's just a, a, a cultural argument. Um, so, the, I mean, the Baltic states really have not had a very different position on almost anything uh, of significance. Please join me in thanking President Ilz for this wonderful conversation. <laughs> wonderful and alarming. Yeah.